Nine years ago, near Nice, a car driven by an ambassador ran into and killed two children. No charges could be brought. French businessman Pierre Falcon is wanted by police for gun running. Now he's a diplomat, they can't touch him. Merette, a young housemaid reduced to slavery, then freed in front of the cameras. Her boss, a diplomat, will never be prosecuted. In France, as in the rest of the world, diplomats can flout the law without ever facing trial. Part of Paris, yet inside this building, we're not quite on French soil anymore. Behind these walls is the Swiss Embassy, and like all other embassies, its diplomats are protected against any intrusion by the French state. Mr. Ambassador, can the police come in here? No. The police can't come in without being authorized to do so, or being called by the ambassador, or by his representative. The ambassadorial territory is impenetrable. That's what makes these premises different. Exactly. It's the same thing in Bern. The Swiss police cannot enter the premises of the French embassy. That's not all. Diplomats can't be tried or even interrogated without their consent. Their possessions and bank accounts can't be seized. Inside or outside the embassy, they're protected from prosecution, whatever crimes they may commit on French soil. This principle is laid down in the Vienna Convention, adopted by all nations in 1961. It's what's known as diplomatic immunity. Without this protection, diplomats would be at the mercy of the authorities in whichever country they were posted, for example, a dictatorial regime could jail them just to put pressure on their country of origin. Everyone understands the need to protect diplomats, except when those among them abuse their immunity to evade justice and break the law with impunity. It starts with minor abuses, as you stroll through the ambassadorial district of Paris, this is what you see. Diplomatic cars often parked illegally. They're easy to spot. They all have a green number plate marked CD. That stands for Diplomatic Corps. CMD, Diplomatic Mission Chief. In other words, Ambassador. Evidently, diplomats aren't worried about parking tickets. So what happens when they're given one? The police department refused to answer that question, so we decided to take a hidden camera to the place where Paris's parking fines are handled, the STCC, the Central Fine Handling Service. We've made up a little story to try to get some information. Good morning. I've come to see you because I'm about to be made a diplomat for the Belgian Embassy, and I'd like some information, if I may, on what happens with diplomatic vehicles as far as parking tickets are concerned. A little taken aback, the receptionist decides it's best to call someone higher up. Hello. I just wanted to know if I ever get a parking ticket, what happens? We don't usually follow them up in Paris. They're put straight to one side. You can park in paid parking spots too. You'll never get a ticket, in any case. Even if you do, it'll never be followed up. Don't use the bus only lanes though, because there's a big crackdown on that at the moment. It serves to improve conditions for bus users. I'd say you've got enough paid parking spots to use that you don't need to go and park anywhere, because we do see diplomatic vehicles parked any old how, and they do get fined by colleagues, and sometimes that can get a bit out of hand. Just because you have diplomatic status, you mustn't think anything goes. 
But the bus lane, if I'm in a rush and I'm going to a meeting... If you use the bus lane, you won't have any bother. OK, well, thank you. You're welcome. Goodbye, thank you. Goodbye. The only thing the police do have the right to do is to move a diplomatic vehicle if it's causing a serious obstruction. We're going to carry out a little test on an ambassador's car parked in a disabled spot. Yes, hello. I'm calling you because I have a disabled person's car, but I can't park in my space next to where I live because there's a car already parked there. OK, we'll take a look. Shall I give you the licence number? Go ahead. CMD... One. Oh, it's a diplomatic vehicle. Don't bother, I, I can't get it towed. It's a car with a green plate. There's no point. I can't have it towed, sir. Why can't you have it towed away? Because they're diplomatic vehicles. They're untouchable. But perhaps you could at least move it. No. <laughs> but hang on, that's incredible. You mean to say I can't use my parking space? No, it's being taken by a diplomatic vehicle. We're nobodies next to them. Untouchable vehicles, fines that end up in the bin, so many little privileges that diplomats would rather not admit to in front of our camera. Diplomats like this one, who's parked his car on the Champs-Élysées while he does a spot of shopping. Excuse me, hello. We're making a documentary for Canal Plus. You aren't worried about your car? Um, from an embassy, so sometimes you need to be a little discreet. Answer me honestly, do you pay your parking tickets? Yes. We know full well that diplomats don't get parking tickets. Yes, they do. <laughs> All of them? Come on, it's not true. It doesn't matter. I don't hold it against you. Yes, yes. Goodbye. In politics, you never reveal all. <laughs> You're a good politician, then. We won't bother him much longer. In terms of diplomatic immunity, there's far worse abuse than that. Paris, November the 16th last year. Little attention's paid to a dozen or so protesters in front of the Saudi Arabian embassy. They've come to support three members of staff sacked three weeks ago without reason or compensation. A secretary, a translator and a receptionist. All three have been hired in France and should have enjoyed the protection of French workers' rights. But the embassy couldn't care less. He told me, if you quit, I'll give you 8,000 euros. If you don't, I won't give you a penny. I said to him, 30 years of work and you want to give me 8,000 euros? That's the thanks you get after 28 years of service. I gave my blood, worked my fingers to the bone. I told him that. A union representative has come to add his weight to the protest. He's been defending mistreated embassy staff for years. The Saudi Arabian case is not an isolated one. We've had incidences in the Kuwaiti embassy and more recently in the Moroccan one. And then there are different degrees. And what degree is Saudi Arabia? Here we're really at rock bottom, rock bottom. I mean, the situation is so paradoxical. Those working on Avenue Och at the Saudi embassy in Paris have fewer rights than the Saudi workers in Saudi Arabia itself. Three years ago, the embassy was convicted by an industrial tribunal in a similar case. But it simply plays the immunity card to avoid paying up. They refused to pay what the tribunal told them to, so, in the end, we sent a bailiff to seize their accounts, except the accounts are in the embassy's accounts and come within the field of diplomatic protection. And to top it all, the embassy has never paid national insurance contributions for its workers, which means there's now a problem with unemployment benefit. Will you be able to go on benefits or not? I don't think so. I don't think so, because in any case, the embassy never paid national insurance. I went to the unemployment office. They told me, Mr. Abdelatif, you're not eligible. We're going to try to get close to the embassy, if that's all right with you. The demonstrators now want to meet the ambassador, but their way is barred by two plainclothes policemen. We're only asking for the right to... You're seeking a meeting with the ambassador. So we will go into the embassy to see whether he'll agree to meet you or not. It's up to us to take this step. And you, in the meantime, you stay here. A few minutes later... I'm sorry, they don't want to. They said no. But they did say that if these people have a grievance, they should take it up through the tribunal. And in that case, you should write a letter and send it through the post. 
They failed today, but the demonstrators are determined not to leave it at that. We'll be back here next Wednesday, same time, same place. To date, despite several demonstrations, they've got nowhere. And our requests for an interview with the ambassador have gone unheeded. Unfair dismissal, unpaid national insurance contributions, it's just the tip of the iceberg. Because inside the embassies, far away from the cameras, there are more victims. Paris, 19th arrondissement, the Committee Against Modern Slavery. Vice President Silvio D has been fighting the exploitation of house servants in France for more than 20 years. Oh, les archives. Every year, the association deals with around 300 cases. It may seem unbelievable, but in one in five incidents, the employer is a diplomat. Ten years ago, the case of a young Ethiopian maid aroused public awareness for the first time. She was the maid of a high-ranking Lebanese diplomat, and she managed to send a letter to one of her uncles to say she couldn't go out, that she didn't have her passport, that she wasn't being paid, and that she was working non-stop. The association decided to strike a decisive blow by freeing the young slave in front of the cameras of the evening news. And here is Meret, 22 years old, terrorized by the freedom she's finally gained. So we freed her. We got her out of there. And we went straight to the Lebanese embassy to see the diplomat. She was very high and mighty about it. You employ a young Ethiopian called Miss Gafeli, don't you? She's run away. She said, I saved her from misery. She owes me everything. I treated her like a princess. It was absolutely incredible. The princess worked a 15-hour day shut up in the diplomat's house. Since then, she started a new life in France. As for her boss, she went back to Lebanon and has never been troubled. Three years later, an even more serious case made headlines. Lalita, a 16-year-old Indian maid, tortured by her employer and Indian diplomat. We'd never had such an appalling case. Next to her is Professor Debray, who held a press conference to say she'd been the victim of torture and barbaric acts. Her genital and urinary apparatus had been mutilated. There were knife wounds that were not the result of an abortion or a female circumcision. He told me he'd never seen anything like it. And it's the same old story. The diplomat went back to India and was never tried. It's really a scandal because, well, you would think immunity might be brought into play in a certain number of cases of a political nature. But these acts which arise out of their private lives, we can't see why immunity should cover people to such an extent. It's really scandalous. No country is safe from such a scandal. Even peaceful Geneva in Switzerland hides sordid affairs of slavery. It's one of the cities with the greatest number of diplomats in the world, 33,000, five times more than Paris. Here, dozens of international organizations such as the World Health Organization, UNICEF, or the most famous, the United Nations, have their headquarters. Against the power of these institutions, it's in this modest apartment block that one man fights a lone battle against diplomatic immunity. His name is Luis Cid. Born in Chile, he's been a political refugee in Switzerland for 30 years. He's created Union Without Borders, an association whose goal it is to defend house servants who are exploited by diplomats. His whole family has to make do with one room in this small two-room flat. He's turned the other into an office where he works with his wife. Their only income is a disability allowance that Louis Cid receives following an accident at work. It may look a little makeshift, but all the same. 
Here, you have all the diplomatic missions concerned, Ghana, Guatemala. Over the last 15 years, he's logged cases of abuse in almost every embassy. How many files are there altogether? 280 files. Thanks to these files, he's forced dozens of diplomats to compensate their staff, and he's annoyed more than one. I've received death threats, all types of threats. There are a lot of ambassadors who want my head. They threatened you verbally or not? Yes, yes, verbally. Verbally, during a meeting? What exactly did they say? Do you remember the words they used? The ambassador of told me, I will do everything possible so that you stop your work for good. Here are the archives of a few press flyers. To protect himself against intimidation, Luis Cid decided to go public with every case he dealt with. All this, it's a sort of life insurance. Exactly. Among some of the tricky cases on the go is that of Victorine. This 31-year-old Nigerian was a maid to an ambassador. She couldn't stand her work conditions anymore, so two months ago she ran away. With Luis Sid's help, she decided to ask for compensation. The two of them are going to the capital, Bern, today to meet the lawyer of the ambassador who employed Victorine. Ah, it's so green, the canton of Fribourg. Switzerland's lovely. <laughs> today she smiles. She didn't used to smile. She was like a wounded little animal that didn't know where to hide. Victorine arrived in Switzerland a year ago in the hope of being able to feed the four children she left back home. Since then, her life's become a nightmare. This is the house she worked in, the private home of the Nigerian ambassador to the United Nations. I spent 10 months in that house. It was very, very terrible for me there in the house at all. Victorine has kept several photographs of that period. So this is what um, I normally make for the ambassador and his wife every Saturday morning and Sunday morning. I was doing everything, washing the clothes, ironing. So I was preparing it here. Victorine also took care of the children, did the gardening, cleaned the ambassador's car, and even made the clothes his wife wore. She worked non-stop. I'm the one making dresses for her. I start from 6 o'clock to 11, sometimes 12, sometimes 2, when there is dinner, when there is party, sometimes 3 a.m. in the morning. It depends when the party finish whatsoever. I have to be working because I have to be called, bring this, do this, do that. 15 to 18 hours work a day, seven days a week, for 400 euros a month. That's a quarter of the minimum wage for a cleaner in Geneva. Victorine also had to put up with the ambassador's wife's temper. She always told me that they have diplomatic covering, that uh, she's an ambassador wife, that if I don't obey, she might grow angry and shoot me with a gun, that nothing could happen to her. She has a diplomatic... I don't really know. She said they are diplomats, uh, they can do anything, that nobody can come to their compound to question them. Victorine and Louis Sid are meeting the ambassador's lawyer to seek compensation. We followed them with a hidden camera. Given the diplomatic immunity, it looks like an uphill battle. Good day, gentlemen. Welcome. Please take a seat. The lawyer and a colleague receive us in a conference room. As for us, we're officially there to help with the translation. You say Mrs. Okuoza worked so much she could not sleep. For 10 months, 17 hours a day, seven days a week, I find it difficult to believe this 17 hours a day. No, 18, excuse me. So, she only slept for six hours. I find it highly unlikely that someone could do that. In all probability, Mrs. Okuoza didn't work any more than eight or nine hours that we agreed upon in writing. There are plenty of witnesses at the mission who know how long a chauffeur works, how long a maid works. 
Could you believe I could be up from 6 o'clock to 3 p.m. in the morning? I was doing that. I bear everything. I bear everything. I have only two hours a day. These two hours I have to nail down for it. Two hours a week. I nail down on my nails to be able to get that two hours from the ambassador and his wife. An awkward silence, and then the lawyer tries to take charge of the situation. On a l'intérêt de mettre fin à cette affaire. Et pour ça, it's in everyone's interest to bring this matter to a close. I think it's up to me to make an offer to settle the affair. And the offer is to give Mrs. Okuoza 25,000 francs. 25,000 Swiss francs. That's 15,000 euros, roughly the minimum wage in Switzerland. But for Luis Sid, it's not enough, and he threatens to bring a complaint against the ambassador. You're looking at a usurer's bond. Usury is criminal. So the ambassador is running the risk that I ask him to be thrown out of the United Nations. I'm going to ask he be made persona non grata. I don't like your tone at all. I much prefer the respectful tone. It's a sign of good manners. Luis Sid has hit a sensitive spot. If he files a complaint, the ambassador may well have immunity, but the matter risks damaging him and could even cost him his place at the United Nations. Well, an offer from you then, Mr. Sid. What do you suggest? My proposition is very straightforward. Double pay. I'll forget about the rest of the overtime, the Sundays, the bank holidays. I'll forget all that. Ten months at double pay. If you admit 16 hours of work per day, then you automatically accept double pay. 5,000 times 10, that makes how much? Help me. 50,000 francs. 50,000 Swiss francs, 30,000 euros. That's twice what the lawyer offered. There, I'd sign that tomorrow. Demain. I bet, yes. There, sir. The meeting was tense, but matters are clear. The ball is now in the ambassador's court. In the meantime, Victorine would very much like to pick up her belongings. When she ran away two months ago, she left most of her clothes in her employer's house. We go back there with her, with our hidden camera. She's afraid of coming face to face with the ambassador's wife again. It's going to be stressful for me. She doesn't uh, have respect for others. Uh, she treats people the way she likes. Uh, she might be screaming, I don't know. She might even ask me to walk out. It's the housekeeper that opens the door. She asks her to leave. So I won't take my things? That I won't take my things? That he's shouting. That I should not enter. So I won't take my things? I should be naked. Yes? Suddenly, the ambassador's wife opens the door. I want to collect my clothes. That's why I came. Please. I'm very sorry. I don't know what you removed or your things you removed or your things you left. I don't know. So after two months coming back to a residence of an ambassador to say you want to come in and take your things, I don't know. So please, it is better to write, I, to write the way you have written to me. Write officially that uh, to the mission, please, write to the mission. So I can't pick my things, that's Not what that you're saying? No, that you can't go through the process now. What I'm trying to explain to you is that the process is that... Actually, it, madam, I'm a journalist from okay, France. Okay. And um, I'm trying to understand what happened yes. between you and her. Could mm. you tell me... Could you... No, that's okay, that's okay. Could you tell me 
just just to no, understand. No, 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 please. Oh. Uh, this is a diplomatic house. You know, well, we're not supposed to have this forum in my You can go. There's no room for that now. No. Yeah. Exactly. The conversation's cut short. We're asked to leave the premises. No, I would like to tell you something. Please, please. Mm. If you like to ask anything, you meet the ambassador in the office. Right. Just right. In this unequal combat against the diplomats, victims must arm themselves with patience. Dealings with diplomats take several years. Bonsoir. While they wait, they can stay in this apartment that Luis managed to secure from the Swiss government. Thank you, Mom. So <laughs> on, yeah. Victorine has lived here since she ran away. She shares this three-room flat with four other women who also fled their employers. This room, this is the room where I share, we are here in this room. The women have rebuilt their world here. Yes, they're a little on top of each other, but at last Victorine can breathe. I'm free as a normal human. I can talk to people, I can greet people, I can chat with people, I can go out and come in. At least it's better. She now hopes to resolve matters as quickly as possible so she can go back home to her husband and children. Here, each woman has a painful tale to tell. <laughs> For example, five years ago, Din, a Filipino, almost died escaping from the house where she was being held by her boss. She told me, if you want to go out, you can use the window, not the door. I will ask her, if I will use the window, I will die. I will not go back to the Philippines. My employer told me, OK, if you will die, I will burn your body and I will give it to your mother as a gift. That night, Din did indeed leave by the window, but the rope gave out 10 metres from the ground. She almost broke her back. And then also I have a problem with my pelvis. I need, I need to use, uh, I need to put one and a half centimetre with my shoes. This is the difference, you see? Now, you need to wear this. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Oh. I cannot sit alone within three hours because my back is too much pain. Mm. It's two months since we visited the apartment. Victorine still hasn't received her compensation, but thanks to her fight and that of the other maids, certain diplomats no longer feel they're quite so untouchable. Thank you for everything. Good night. <laughs> Only once in France has this absolute protection of diplomats been broken, thanks to the pressure of public opinion. It was in May 1996 at Montan near Nice. Two children, Ronald, age 13, and Raphael, 12, were killed when they were run over by a car on a pedestrian crossing. Behind the wheel, the ambassador of Zaire, Ramazani Bayer. He was driving at 120 kilometers per hour, four times the speed limit, his only punishment, he was simply recalled to his country. We caught up with the man who, at the time, fought relentlessly to have the ambassador's diplomatic immunity lifted. He's the father of Raphael, one of the children killed. Hello? Where are you, darling? I'm here. Is that it? Have you finished getting your horse ready? Today, Patrick Lenoir lives near Montpellier, where he runs a riding school. He's rebuilt his life here with his 13-year-old daughter, Aurore. He remembers the feeling that overcame him nine years ago when he learned that the man responsible for the death of his son was untouchable. It was anger and incomprehension. I said to myself, Hang on, when you commit a serious fault, and it was a serious fault after all, running over two children on a pedestrian crossing, the fault must be punishable. It's completely inadmissible that someone can escape the law. 
In this kind of incident, it's just not possible. In Raphael's memory, Patrick decided to do all he could to have the ambassador tried in France. For me, it was a way of paying him a final tribute, of saying to him, OK, this happened to you and you're no longer here, but at least the person that did this to you has been tried. Something has happened to him, and it's true. It was important to me. It was crucial. There was only one way to bring the case to trial. Zaire had to lift its ambassador's diplomatic immunity. And Patrick worked tirelessly to rally the press and public opinion to that end. I did loads of things so people wouldn't forget. So they continued to agitate. His stubbornness paid off. The indignation soon spread to the benches of the lower house of parliament. Questioned by MPs, the foreign minister, Hervé de Charette, was forced to publicly pledge to pressure Zaire. We have asked the Zaire authorities to lift diplomatic immunity and we will be pressing this matter most firmly because it is a question of justice and of respect to the families. I have told you everything, members of the House. To this day, Hervé de Charette remembers the efforts he went to to persuade Zaire to resolve the problem. We didn't have means of applying judicial pressure, but we did have ways of applying diplomatic pressure. It so happens we extended credit to this country, so we take positive decisions concerning the country. We have ways of intervening, but it's not blackmail. Simply, we can make our feelings known. We can call the minister up, our ambassador over there can go and see the people he usually talks to. We can highlight certain things. It took two months of diplomatic strong-arming before the president of Zaire, Mobuto, finally gave in. He authorised his ambassador to return to France to face trial. Why did you decide to come back to France? Listen. I said, the day after the accident happened, that I was prepared to come back to France and give myself up to the French judicial system. I went back to my country and I'm back here today of my own free will. A return which, according to Gilbert Collard, the lawyer for the family of one of the victims, was negotiated at the highest level in France. We managed to get the French diplomatic service involved, the head of state involved. You mean to say that you virtually forced Jacques Chirac to put pressure on Mobutu? That would be pretentious on my part, but we were quite a team working in that direction, and I believe that's what we achieved. You mean, according to your information, Jacques Chirac pressured Mobutu? Well, it's obvious. At the trial, Ramazani Bayer was given a two-year suspended prison sentence and fined 56,000 francs. A sentence which appears light today, but which was quite normal at the time. Since then, the former ambassador has returned to his country, and that's where we tracked him down. After a little hesitation, he accepted our request for an interview. Next stop, Kinshasa in Central Africa. On the banks of the River Congo, this is the capital of old Zaire, now renamed the Democratic Republic of Congo. The tragedy at Monton hasn't damaged the career of Ramazani Baya. Here he is today, surrounded by cameras at a press conference. Because a year and a half ago, he was named as his country's foreign minister. Today, he's receiving the Belgian Minister for Cooperation. Despite a tight schedule, he finds time to receive us and explains his side of events. Nine years on, he too thinks his court hearing was necessary. Not only for the families, but for me too. Not to clear my conscience. Today, almost ten years later, it's still something that eats away at me. But at least I know I've been before the judge before the families who said what they had to say, who also believed to a certain extent that I should have been sent to prison. 
It would have been difficult for me to have been sent to jail, but at least the families have the relief of knowing I've been judged. Would you have been prepared to go to jail if you had been sentenced to that? Look, if I went back, it was because I was ready to fully face the consequences of what I have done. In agreeing to be tried, Ramazani Baya behaved impeccably. But we discovered that at the same time, he was playing the immunity card in another matter. Sassia M. Salam met him six years before the Monton accident. Ever since, she's been battling for the rent he owes her, but has never paid. Every legal process she started has collapsed. Here you go. The tribunal rejected my request. Given when signing the lease on the 18th of May 1990, Mr. and Mrs. Ramazani Baya had diplomatic immunity. Mrs. Emsalem's case is dismissed. So it's because of immunity? As far as the tribunal's concerned, it's because of the immunity. So the tribunal accepts the facts but declares itself incompetent in the matter. Here's the house Mrs. M. Salem rented the ambassador at a cost of 21,000 francs a month at Clamart near Paris. It's a very attractive upmarket property, 800 square meters with a pool and a garage. When he moved out, the ambassador owed 70,000 euros in back rent. He said, but Mrs. M. Salem don't look like that. You know, if I'd wanted to stay here for 10 years without paying you, I would have. So we have one more little question to ask the minister. You accepted that your diplomatic immunity be lifted in the case of the car crash, yet at the same time you hide behind it when it comes to paying the rent you still owe on your house in Clamart. I didn't hide behind my diplomatic immunity. First of all, I'd like to say an ambassador sent abroad doesn't pay his own rent. It's his country that pays. So it's confusing to say the ambassador didn't pay. It's the government that pays. But the lease was in your name. That's why I'm putting the question to you. It can be in the ambassador's name, it can be in the embassy's name, in the name of the Republic. In this case, it was in your name. Yes, but an ambassador who's on a mission abroad, it's the same situation here. We have a lot of ambassadors and we have a lot of problems with rent. But it's not the ambassador, it's his country. How long have you been waiting for your money? Well, if I start from the legal proceedings, it's 11 years. It's a debt that's owed to Mrs. Emerslam, and I think actually she's been paid. That would have to be checked. No, no, she hasn't been paid. It would have to be checked with the budget minister. It's one of the things we are worried about. Because in any case, at this moment in time, she hasn't been paid. Listen, let me check with finance. The minister calls a colleague in the financial department in front of us. Alex, how are you? Listen, I'm sorry to bother you in a meeting. I'm with some journalists from Canal Plus who've come to ask me some questions about diplomatic immunity. They want to know if the back rent has been paid to Mrs. Emerson or not. They think I hid behind diplomatic immunity to avoid paying. It's been paid? Are you sure? It's been done? OK, thanks a lot. So it's going to be paid. Listen, he told me for his part, he's issued the instruction. Now you need to check with the central bank, but that'll take a few days. A month and a half after our interview, as we finish this report, Mrs. M. Solem still hasn't been paid. Diplomats are protected, but their partners and their children are too. And that can cause problems sometimes. For more than two years, the son of a diplomat took advantage of immunity to assault and rob people with impunity. Jean sur marne a Paris suburb, in this housing estate, the son of a member of staff at the embassy of Chad enjoyed a long reign of terror. Last summer, one of his victims, a student called Stefan, came across him one evening as he was entering the building.
I was just about to open my door when I felt someone coming up on me. I was slammed against the door and found myself flat on my stomach like this. He was saying, go on, let go, let go. Apparently, he wanted to take my bag. He wanted your laptop computer. Just then, my friend opened the window and said, stop, I'm going to call the police. The aggressor ran away, but the police caught him, only to have to let him go again an hour later. Diplomatic immunity. So Stefan had filed a complaint for nothing. I was pretty devastated. Luckily, he hadn't stolen anything from me. If he had, I wouldn't even have been able to get my things back. That's what the police told me. My things would have all been his, full stop. Stefan's aggressor's been notching up these kind of crimes since he was 17 years old. Drugs, theft, violence. The police have arrested him seven times, and seven times they've let him go. Among his playgrounds is this hypermarket just behind the estate. The shop's management didn't want to talk to us, but the security guards know the ambassador's son well. He wasn't violent, but he stole from the shop. He shoplifted. What did he take? Alcohol. Here, the young, it's alcohol. You should see what he was like behind the tills. He yelled. It was like, I'm untouchable. It was almost like that. What did he say exactly? Get off. Don't touch me. My guards were fed up because there was no point calling the police. You have to wait until the police are available. In the meantime, he'd be shouting in your ear, bunch of puffs, haven't you anything better to do? Is that the only job you know how to do? You're thugs, because he knew we couldn't touch him. Untouchable until his father returned to Chad last year. The youth no longer has immunity, but he commits another crime. This time, the courts get him, and they sentence him to a month behind bars. Six months later, we found him on some wasteland with his friends. Was it fun having immunity? It was fun. Is that why you said to yourself, well, I can carry on anyway because I've got immunity? No, it's not because of that. Actually, I didn't want it anymore. You didn't want immunity anymore? Yeah, because it caused problems for my parents. Not serious ones, but anyway. You mean they had problems? You mean your parents had problems? They were called to account by the embassy? Exactly. They told them they had to take me in hand. The embassy said that? Yes. Yes, OK, so that was the problem for you? Yes. The youth's escapades went all the way to the embassy. In fact, one of its representatives was summoned by the French Foreign Ministry, the Quai d'Orsay. Did France supply pressure for the father of the delinquent to be recalled to Chad? The Quai d'Orsay declined to comment. It has to be said that when it comes to matters involving diplomatic immunity, the role played by the French authorities isn't always clear. September the 24th, 2004, it's 2 a.m. on the Champs-Élysées, when suddenly a black Porsche roars by at 140 kilometers per hour, running all the lights. Behind the wheel, clearly under the influence of alcohol, Hannibal Gaddafi, the Libyan president's youngest son. He was arrested after a police chase. Philippe Lavenu from the police union Alliance takes the story on. The vehicle was intercepted roughly here. Our colleagues blocked the Porsche and asked the passengers to get out of the vehicle. There were two people inside. They were asked to get out, which they didn't do straight away. Our colleagues also noticed very quickly that there were two other vehicles parked close by. They were bodyguards' cars. The bodyguards got out and began assaulting the police. Punches and kicks were thrown. There was damage to property and, above all, one of our colleagues was off work for 10 days because he'd taken a lot of punches. Matters became even more complicated when Hannibal revealed his identity. The police then contacted the night duty officer at the Quai d'Orsay, the French foreign ministry. The Quai d'Orsay told us that, yes, this man was in fact the son of Muammar Gaddafi and that he did have diplomatic immunity, according to the Quai d'Orsay. Our colleagues couldn't take him in for questioning or take any coercive measures, despite the punches that had been thrown, despite him driving under the influence of alcohol and all the risks he may have taken, and he was simply released. Yet Hannibal Gaddafi was not on a diplomatic mission, but on holiday, and therefore wasn't covered by diplomatic immunity. 
had the Quai d'Orsay deliberately lied to the police. Despite our requests for an interview, the minister refused to meet us. We decided to invite ourselves to his press briefing. Twice a week, the Quai d'Orsay spokesman deliver a communique on French foreign policy. On the agenda this morning, Hezbollah attacks on Lebanon, the creation of a Franco-Israeli association, and relations between Norway and the European Union. But we're going to upset the agenda a little. Good morning. I'm a journalist with Kennel Plus. We're doing a report on diplomatic immunity. In 2004, Gaddafi's son was arrested on the Champs-Élysées. He was released on the grounds of diplomatic immunity, but according to our sources, he wasn't accredited by the Quai d'Orsay. How can that be? The correct expression is not accredited by the Quai d'Orsay. That's to say diplomatic immunity applies to diplomatic personnel who are on the mission in France, and equally it applies to people on official assignment in France. Was that the case for Gaddafi's son? As far as I'm aware, this was not the case for Gaddafi's son. Therefore, he did not have diplomatic immunity, and we made our displeasure with Mr. Hannibal Gaddafi's behavior clear to the Libyan authorities. So why was he released? That I don't know. At the time, I don't know what the reason was. According to the police, it was at the Quai d'Orsay's request. Listen, I don't know. I do not have all the facts to hand, but I'll give you a reply. But what the spokesman didn't tell us was that 10 days after the Champs-Élysées incident, the foreign minister, Michel Barnier, met the Libyan president, Muammar Gaddafi, in Tripoli. A major reconciliation after 15 years of dispute between the two countries that mustn't be ruined at any cost. Gaddafi's son, doubtless, benefited from matters of state. But once the summit was over, he wouldn't get a second chance. Five months later, the police arrested him in this luxury Parisian hotel for assaulting his partner. This time, he was given a four-month suspended prison sentence. He's lodged an appeal. Diplomatic immunity is so effective, it's aroused the interest of some shady characters. Among them, Pierre Falcon, a French businessman, now a millionaire. He's been under investigation for arms smuggling and fiscal fraud for five years. He was banned from leaving the country, and yet he managed to quit France in the most legal way in the world, after being made a diplomat. Angola, the country to which he sold arms, named him one of their representatives to UNESCO, the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization based in Paris. In becoming a diplomat, Pierre Falcon has become untouchable. But does he really play a role within the organization? We decided to knock on the door of the Angolan ambassador at UNESCO, Falcon Superior. Mr. Ambassador, hello. For the meeting, we pretended to be preparing a general report on UNESCO. Our question about Pierre Falcon took him a bit by surprise, so he told us the truth. We're preparing a report on UNESCO. What role does Mr. Falconi play in your delegation? Well, I would say if you find him, you could certainly ask him. He's not in France, so we can't ask him what role he does play here. I don't think he plays any role. Really? Yes. So what is the point? Why was he nominated? I think every country is sovereign. But with the reorganization that we have carried out, I don't think the role is an individual one. What duties does he carry out then? The role an individual plays in a group depends upon the duties he carries out in the group. What is his role then? He was named Minister Councillor. At the moment, 
I think he's still involved in other missions. You mean he's never worked at UNESCO? Ever since he was nominated? I don't know him. I don't know him. A ghost diplomat in the heart of UNESCO, this affair has been damaging the institution's reputation for two years. Tonight it celebrates its 60th birthday. Its director general, Koichiro Matsura from Japan, has prepared a short speech. He's never wanted to express his opinion on the Falcon affair in public, so now's the moment to bring it up. What do you think of scandals like the Valconi affair, where people who are wanted by the French judicial system are protected by UNESCO's diplomatic immunity? Unfortunately, it's something that happened without UNESCO's knowledge. We found out what happened afterwards. But now you know, so you could lift Mr. Falcone's diplomatic immunity. No, that's down to the French government. It's not down to UNESCO. According to UNESCO, then, the French government is responsible for this situation. We questioned the Quai d'Orsay once more. This time, after the press briefing incident, we obtained a meeting with the spokesman in his office. He contradicted the UNESCO version. According to him, France couldn't do anything to prevent Falcon being nominated. We did not, as a French authority, have the means of opposing that. Then you mean to say that this is an unstoppable formula? If you are being hunted for murder or rape, you can do the same thing. You can find a country which is willing to nominate you to UNESCO and, hey, presto, you're off. You don't have the means to oppose that. Well, if it's a direct accreditation with France, then there is a whole mechanism of agreements. In this case, no. I don't have any further comment to make on it. So that means I'm right. Someone being hunted for murder or rape could... Uh, well, in that case, it's the organization itself that could react in that event. At UNESCO, they told me not. They said they couldn't do anything either. So that means no one can. It seems incredible, but in fact, no one can prevent the nomination of a diplomat to UNESCO. If a country decides one day to nominate a criminal or a terrorist, nothing can stop them. <laughs> Even if a crime against humanity is suspected, the law is powerless. Two years ago, the head of the Congolese police, Jean-Francois Ndenge, was suspected of being involved in the disappearance of hundreds of people in Congo. During a visit to France, he was arrested by the gendarme and then released on grounds of diplomatic immunity. How many diplomats in France escape justice in this way every year? Only the Quai d'Orsay has the answer. But on this subject, as on so many others, it has chosen discretion. It's a matter of diplomacy.